Dr. Mark, thanks so much for joining me today on The Mark Divine Show. Super stoked to have you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I was laughing because I, for some reason, I got in my head that you were at Columbia and in New York City, and you said you're right up the road from me in Irvine. <laughs> right up the road. <laughs> yeah. Literally, like 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Well, man, it's it's super cool to be talking to you. As I mentioned, um, attention is a big, obviously a big issue for everybody, but it's something that I've been teaching SEALs for a long time, like how to, how to really control their attention and avoid uh, distraction and to remain, you know, front sight focused on what's right in front of them. Cause it, you know, as a warrior, as a SEAL, that's critical. And I want to, I'm really excited to get in and talk about your book and all your work, but um, I promise all my listeners that we really want to get to know the person and not just zero in on content, you know, cause there's a lot of content out there, but what's more important is like the person behind the content and the person the authenticity and like the, what shaped you, like what, what was it, what were the formative years uh, that shaped you and some of the challenges and key forces that, that helped you become, you know, a leading psych, no, not psychologist, but doctor, PhD in this, in this area? Well, you know, I did not start out as a psychologist. My first degree was in fine art. Was it really? And oh. I never thought I would do anything else. I, I, I loved the freedom, the creativity. Were you an artist uh, as well? Well, I, I, I got a degree in art that didn't last very long because mm -hmm. I discovered how hard it was to make a living as an mm -hmm. artist. Mm -hmm. And I also had, uh, there, there were other things I could do as well. I, I could do math and science. And I thought, well, it's a lot easier to make a living doing something with math or science and mm -hmm. I can be creative as well. So, so, so not many people, by the way, have that the combination of sciencey mind as well as creative artistic mind. That's interesting. Well, I, I'm a firm believer that everyone should study some form of art, whether it's, you know, painting or music or sculpture or dance but you know something that can really open up people's creativity because you can then apply that to anything else that you do you can apply it to science you can apply it mm -hmm. to business it's it's teaching people how to think out of the box and that's something that we don't really get in current education mm -hmm. um, but if if you if you do some kind of art right? You, you learn how to have what's called lateral thinking, mm -hmm. which means, you know, thinking of combining two very different kinds of ideas together to come up with something new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. I, I use the term contextual thinking. I think that's similar, right? So it's, you're able to take in more context, which allows mm -hmm. you to make more pattern, um, see more patterns and link more ideas, like you said. Yes. That's fascinating. So, so some people are naturally inclined to that like you, but you can also train that. And that's what you're suggesting uh, by taking art classes or studying dance or even a martial art. I think maybe that was, I'm, I'm trying to think of what I have done that made me creative. And it was probably the martial arts <laughs> really helped me. Yeah. There, there are a lot of ways that you can do that. Um, and in fact, you know, I noticed when I got into science that a lot of people are trained in, in what's called linear logical reasoning. So mm -hmm. you reason from A to B to C to D, and you don't go outside of this path. And you close yourself up to, you know, studying new ideas or, mm -hmm. or something different. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, a, a number of psychologists uh, use lateral thinking to come up with, you know, really interesting ideas to test and so, so there I was stuck with an art degree, trying to figure out how am I going to make a living? And through a bit of a circuitous path, I ended up at Columbia University getting a PhD in psychology, mm -hmm. which I found to be an extremely creative endeavor. Hmm. In what way? Because again, it's very much hard science, but I guess you have the the creativity comes in the relationship with the patient and trying to understand what shaped their malady or their outlook on life, those types of things. So it's, you're right. It's, it's hard science. Uh, I was 
in a, an area in my studies of psychology that's called cognitive psychology. So mm -hmm. it's ma many people think of psychology as clinical psychology where you interact with patients. Cognitive psychology is really trying to understand how the mind works, how, how behavior works. Mm -hmm. And so the, the way creativity comes into play is in coming up with hypotheses about humans, mm -hmm. hypotheses about how our minds work, why we do things the way we do. And it, it's so interesting because, you know, they say psychology is proving the intuitive. And everybody has intuitions about mm -hmm. our behavior and how we think. Um, but when you're in psychology, you get to study that. And as a result, you, you often, along the way, come up with all kinds of interesting discoveries. Mm -hmm. Cogn so cognitive science, studying the way the brain works, and, and um, the objectivist view says that cognition or consciousness is eminent from cognition. Basically, brain activity creates thought that creates self-awareness or what one would call consciousness. What is your view? I mean, this is kind of an out there philosophical question. What is your view of the kind of the Eastern um, perspectives that consciousness is not caused by brain activity, but is a there's a codependent origination or codependent relationship between consciousness and cognition or awareness and thought or the objective and the subjective? Well, um, this is, I wanted this to is take a... it down because it's really interesting to me. And so I, you're the first cognitive scientist I've talked to in a long time. And I just, yeah. I'm, I'm so, I think here, here, let me add some context. And I'll, I want to come back to our, I told you we can go in any direction, but I want to come back to attention. This will somehow relate to it. But the, the objective view that everything is conflated or, you know, arises from biological activity is one of the, you know, in my view is one of the challenges that we face in Western science, because it doesn't, you know, back to your creative thing, it doesn't allow for, you know, spontaneous creativity or direct, the ideas of direct perception of knowing things without knowing why or how you could possibly know them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and ways of thinking that, right, thinking about the human experience that couldn't possibly be known just through simply having experienced something before biologically or, or, you know, in, in one's lived experience. Yeah. So, so cognition is about interpretation. So if I see a tree and you see a tree, we might have very different interpretations of that tree. And it's based on what, you know, the, our sensory experience of right. what we're seeing in that tree it's also based on our life experience, our yeah. lived experience of all the, everything uh, that goes that. into forming that interpretation. And what's really interesting is how we relate to people. Because, yeah. you know, you might have a conversation with an individual. And this is what the field of social psychology covers. How, how social conditions and the social environment affect your interpretation mm -hmm. of that interaction. So, so yes, there is a, of course, a biological basis, a, a sensory basis, taking in information through our senses, but then we also interpret that data mm -hmm. and that interpretation that comes from so many different, uh, places in our lives, our experiences, our uh, but so, so where I, was, I would say that interpretation is strictly related to the, the prior conditioning, right? It doesn't have to be. It can, okay. you, can, you can have a new interpretation, a new idea about something. Possibly it, it can be traced back to some kind of prior conditioning. For example, if I didn't have certain experiences, a particular idea may not have come to me. Right. Right. right? Exactly. So there, 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 you know, can it can be traced back to prior experiences, but you know, 
this gets this gets very uh, murky, and it's it's very hard to be able to um, to study this. I'm an empiricist, exactly. and yeah, I, yeah. I like to be able to study these kinds of phenomena. Yeah, I can see what you're saying. I mean, how would you draw the line between, you know, a new thought that is purely new versus what's perceived to be a new thought, but it's actually filtered through a lifetime of conditioning. And yeah. it's, it, it shows up as new because at that moment, the conditioning arranged it as such, right? <laughs> From a That's million. right. We're, we're, we're getting into the realm of philosophy yeah. and right. the, it's fascinating. And so- It is. I know, but the listeners are probably going, oh, there you go, Divine. You're just, you know, going off into a ditch again in philosophy because I'd I love to, you know, we don't talk enough about philosophy, I think, in our culture. Uh, it's because it's really interesting getting to the meaning of, of like, just the nature of self and, and self-awareness and discovering things like, you know, what your study, like what does it mean to pay, actually pay attention to something? And what does it mean to have your attention co-opted by mm. either technology or social media or, you know, influences that are trying to kind of own a piece of your attention, which is all over the place, right? Most yeah. people never think about that because they don't take the time to study themselves. And you can do that either through a, a deep Western program like the PhD in psychology or psychotherapy or philosophy, or through, a, you know, more of an Eastern self-awareness program, like meditation, mm -hmm. mindfulness, yoga, or Zen. You know, that was my path. I took, I started Zen training when I was 21 and it, it changed my life, like mm. radically. And within two to three years, I went from being a CPA MBA on Wall Street to being a Navy SEAL, <laughs> number one in my class. <laughs> And it was all about the Zen training, 100%. Training the brain, attention control, concentration, becoming more aware. Yeah. Anyways. So there, there, there are different kinds of attention. There, there's many, there are many different ways to think about attention. And you can think of attention as being under our control. And you can also think of attention as being automatic. Right. And so when attention is under our control, it involves effort, some kind of mental effort. And we do things intentionally. Mm -hmm. So if, if I'm writing something, I'm using controlled attention, controlled processing, it's called. If you're diving as a Navy SEAL, you're going to be using controlled attention. You have to be very alert and very aware of your surroundings. But we also have another kind of attention that's automatic. And this is not something that's under our control. And an another term for this kind of attention is called exogenous. And that means we respond to things that are external to us. Is that so, the same as a default mode network? That term, the default mode network, is that exogenous, uncontrolled attention? Yeah, y yes. <laughs> so an example of what captures our automatic attention is, you know, the blinking notifications on your screen. Or, you know, I have my smartphone next to me, just the sight of my smartphone can trigger an automatic impulse right. to grab for that smartphone. A lot of things we do are automatic. We, we can be driving and driving can become automatic, right? Because many people have driven for a number of years. As soon as the light turns yellow, you suddenly, you know, put your foot on the brakes. Or if someone swerves in front of your car, your attention is no longer automatic and suddenly you're focused on what that thing is in front of you, you're trying to avert a crash. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our lives are a combination of using controlled processing, controlled attention, and automatic processing. Mm -hmm. And it's important to think about when we use our devices, which is a good chunk of our day, very, very big chunk of our day, um, to understand what what are the forces that lead us to behave automatically and also to use controlled attention. And some of these forces are within ourselves. That's right. This is so interesting. Like, first of all, when you said 
speaking about the unconscious attention or the automatic, right? When you come to, when I see a yellow light, I step on the gas. And I think most guys would be like, yeah, that's, that's my pattern response. Step on the gas, don't step on the brakes. I'm just joking. But, but you're still using controlled attention to do that. That's true. Right? That's not. What, whatever your response is, all of a sudden you, you've stopped being an automatic pilot mode in your car and you've switched to using your attention controlled attention. Control. Yeah, I see that. Isn't it fascinating? I'm sure part of your research is like what happened to the, what's happened to the human brain since 2007? Because, you, you know, that term you use is, sounds so normal now, but like if you had said, yeah, we're always using our devices or not far away from our devices. If you had said that in 2006, I would have been like, what, what device are you talking about? <laughs> And now, like 2000, when when the iPhone came out, I remember first playing around with like, huh, interesting phone. But now it's a device that we're it's, never far from. And you're right; it captures your mind. It, it's the you know the the idea of the extended mind. That yes. is our extended mind. It is. Obviously. It is. It, it it technology has become an extension of ourselves, right. and it's so important. We we need to draw the line, yes. right? And that's one of the problems we face that we just can't draw that line. Um, people- there hasn't been enough time to study and understand the effects, right? That's it right. It takes a, several generations to be like, whoa, you know, let's do something different here. Are we coming to that point where there's enough information out now that's, that we can actually have that serious discussion about doing something different with these technologies? I, I think we can have these discussions. I, I also think there's a lot more study that needs to be done. But I think we can have these discussions because we're seeing the effects. Yeah. We're seeing that a lot of people get exhausted when they mm -hmm. use their technologies. I mean, technology has been designed to extend our capabilities to allow us to do more. Mm -hmm. But when people get themselves exhausted, they're actually doing less. Mm -hmm. And so we do need to have these kinds of discussions to understand, you know, wh where is that line? Where can we draw that line between, mm -hmm. you know, to create the separation of technology from ourselves? Yeah. So what's the research, Gloria, on what the effect is on the brain and attention from what I'm not sure what you call it, addiction to or overuse of or just just this new way of living. I, I would call it overuse. I, I would stay away from the term addiction because that's a very extreme term. Yeah. And, but I would call it overuse. And, you know, I've been studying people's relationship with their technology since, uh, well, for a very long time. And I, I started formally looking at attention back in 2004. Okay. And at the time, found that people spent an average of about two and a half minutes on any screen before switching. And then I, I kept studying this. And that was this. mostly computers, though, right? That, that was, was mostly really computers yeah. at the time. And then smartphones came along. And in the last five, six years, we find that attention on any screen averages about 47 seconds. Wow. And if, if you look at the, the midpoint of the observations. That's called the median. Mm -hmm. That means that half of all the observations are less than 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. So we have this kind of behavior that we've developed when we use our smartphones and also our computers that, that I call kinetic attention. And what I mean by that is our attention is very dynamic. Mm -hmm. We shift from screen to screen, device to device, we scroll. And so we have this kind of kinetic behavior that we've developed. Um, and it's, you know, others, it's not just my own research, but others have independently come to uh, the same uh, the same metrics within a few seconds. So it's a pretty robust, res robust result, 47 seconds on average hmm. on a screen. That's incredible. And so it seems like that the... the you know, the, the therapy or the psychology profession has been, you know, what's the word, you know, what's the word I'm looking for when you, my brain is a little bit, 
maybe overused from <laughs> its own attention deficit. Um, diagnosing people with ADD and ADHD, you know, like almost like as an epidemic. Do you think it's just literally the training of the brain through using these technologies at faster and faster speeds, or is it really a disorder? I, I do not believe it's a disorder. So yeah. um, first of all, the, the difference between someone who has a true diagnosis of ADHD and a person who's using their computer and phone and having this kind of kinetic, what I call kinetic attention, dynamic attention, is that if a person who does, is not diagnosed with the ADHD puts down their devices, mm -hmm. then you're not <clears throat> going to see this kind of kinetic attention behavior. I mean, it might stick for a little bit, mm -hmm. but people will go back to their true natures. But someone who does have ADHD truly, uh, they will have this kind of behavior irrespective of whatever environment they're in, whether it's a digital environment or non-digital environment. Okay. That's a good distinction. I didn't know that. So what are the, some of the the um, negative effects of this declining attention span or this, you know, active, you know, I forget the term you use, this kinetic attention? Yeah. So first of all, um, we know it's associated with making more errors. Okay. And we know this from decades and decades of research in the laboratory, but also research in the wild, which means looking at people in their natural environments. We know that doctors make more errors. In fact, there's a study that showed that doctors made more prescribing errors really? when they were shifting their attention rapidly, which is pretty Very scary. Cool. Nurses make more errors. Pilots make more errors. So um, that in terms of performance and accuracy, it's it's not good. We, we also know that it takes longer for people to accomplish any task if they keep switching their attention away from one task to another. And there's something called a switch cost, right? right. So every time you switch your attention, you incur an extra cost in time. Right. And and I can I can explain what's behind that. Every time you do some task, imagine that you've got this internal whiteboard in your mind mm -hmm. and you're writing information about that task that you need in order to do the task. Uh, if you're a Navy SEAL and you're diving, you know, you've got this internal whiteboard about all the information you mm -hmm. need to, you know, to do your, your job. But if you suddenly switch your attention, and you switch it to something else, you have to erase that whiteboard and write down new mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm working on writing something and all of a sudden I switch to email, I'm erasing all that information I had when I was writing, say, that chapter, and I have to write new information about the email in mm -hmm. this internal yeah. whiteboard in my mind. And then I switch and I switch to another task and then to another task. And all this writing and rewriting on the whiteboard, uh, it's getting us exhausted. And I'll talk about that for a moment, in a, in a moment. Um, but it, it takes longer for us right. to reorient, to get back to the thing we were interrupted from. And, and probably the, the worst effect of all is that uh, we get ourselves stressed. And we know that when people rapidly switch attention, we know their blood pressure rises. Mm -hmm. There's a physiological marker in the body that indicates people are stressed. Uh, in my own research, we've had people wear heart rate monitors and it measures what's called heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. It's a measure of stress, and we see that that's been associated with fast attention shifting. Hmm. And we, also, we've we've asked people to self-report, so we use um, standard psychological scales of stress, and people report having more stress psychologically 
when they switch their attention. That's fascinating. Do, do we know why? Any, any speculation on why the sympathetic nervous system is triggered when you task, do that rapid task shifting? Yeah, yeah. So that all that writing and rewriting on that internal whiteboard, it involves a lot of mental effort. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we're trying to keep track of multiple things in our minds. It's like juggling plates, keeping mm-hmm. plates spinning, mm-hmm. right? So when you leave an unfinished task, it doesn't really escape your mind very easily. And mm-hmm. there's some some really classic research that was done a century ago by a, a researcher called Bluma Zygarnik. Mm. It's called the Zygarnik effect. And it shows that we remember unfinished tasks and we, it's hard to get them out of our minds. Mm-hmm. And in fact, if you're trying to go to sleep and you have trouble trying to get to sleep, it can actually help you to write down your unfinished tasks. And totally. that can help you fall asleep because otherwise it keeps churning around in your that. mind. I love that. That's one of our, our, our tools for my Unbeal Mind program is this evening ritual to to clear out unfinished, you know, clear out the mental inbox and eradicate regrets and just, you know, go to bed with a clean slate. And it's super effective. Mm-hmm. It's neat. I didn't realize this research though, but it makes sense. And the other yeah. thing it w- was coming up to me is like, it would help me. Well, first off, I, it's not obvious. I don't think to the human being, how much energy is used with this virtual computer that we have in our heads, right? It's obvious when you go out and lift weights, right? It, there's, there's effort involved. You're moving some, some something heavy. Your body sweats. Your heart rate is up. In you know, any type of physical activity, it's obvious that you're spending a lot of energy. But fatigue from the, using the virtual computer in your head, it, it like creeps up really slowly until all of a sudden it hits you. Right? It's just somehow it's not obvious because it's not overt to us. We can't see it objectively. Is there any way, first of all, on that note, can you tell us like, just how much energy is used through this virtual computer and, and the inefficient use of that virtual computer through you know, constant task switching and unfinished business? And how do we become more aware of the energy uses and more effective at managing that energy? Yeah, those are such great questions. So we have a limited set of attentional resources or right. It's been called mental resources or cognitive resources. And you can think of it as your attentional capacity. Mm-hmm. And I love the term. it's yeah. limited. These resources are limited and they're very precious. And and they drain when we do hard tasks, right? We we use them up when we're trying to be focused for a long period of time, but we also use them up when we're constantly switching. Right. And, you know, it, it's wasting resources that could be used for actually doing the work. And instead, we're using these resources to try to reorient to this task and, you know, keep track of that uninter- that interrupted task. And so it's like a, having a leaky tank. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's really important to think about how we can make the best use of these precious limited resources. Mm. I've read somewhere, I think that like the brain takes, and I know there's more that going on and processing all the senses and everything than just the brain, but the brain takes 40% of our body's energy. Is that just an anecdotal thing or is there some research to that? I I know that the brain uses a lot of, uh, a lot of energy. I, I'm not surprised by that figure. You're not. Okay. So I, 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 I would have to look it up, but I, I'm not at all surprised. By yeah, it. but that that if it's true, even if it's close, it puts a big exclamation point on on what you just let you know said that mental work takes an enormous amount of your energy, almost half of the energy that you have available to you. So wow, wouldn't it make sense to learn how to manage that energy and also how to maybe create more energy yes right for the brain to use more efficiently or more effectively or more, with more concentration power so what are some of your discoveries on how we save energy and I, I think basically you already answered that by saying concentrate on one thing at a time 
saves yes. energy, right? Any other ways to save energy and then maybe shifting to like, how, is there any way to actually generate more energy for our mind? Well, yeah. I, I mean, saving energy, you're right, is uh, trying to do more monotasking as opposed to multitasking. One of the best ways to generate energy, and I'm sure you know this, your listeners know this, is to get a really good night's sleep. Yes. Because then we start our day with a full tank of mm -hmm. mental resources. Mm -hmm. Now, in our in, you know current times, a lot of people accumulate sleep debt. Mm -hmm. And sleep debt means if, if I need eight hours of sleep a night and I'm only getting six, I'm accumulating debt. Right. And I, we know from... Uh, from research that I've done, that as the debt increases, our ability to pay attention decreases and our attention spans decrease. Right. And it's also associated with doing lightweight activities. So yeah. if you just don't have the attentional capacity, what do people do? Well, they go to social media or they surf the web because they don't have the resources to be able to do hard focused work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the same is true of taking really good, significant breaks to be able to replenish. And mm -hmm. we tend not to do that. We tend to schedule our days with tasks and meetings back to back without any breaks. And that's right. the worst thing we can do. We, we think we're doing more, but we're actually doing less. Right. Because we're getting ourselves exhausted and we don't have the capacity to be able to do hard work, to be creative, right? right. And creativity is, is really important. And so it's really important to become aware of your own attentional capacity and understanding, experiencing when it's, uh, when your tank is starting to get low and that's the time to pull away. In fact, even to be proactive, right? to pull away and take a really good break and get yourself replenished. And, and we'll all, we'll be able to do more if we do that. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I love this idea of doing less things better, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I've, I've also love the kind of corresponding ideas to say, say no in service to a higher yes or a bigger yes. Right. So, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about how we manage our schedule. Right. So saying no to all the useless meetings that just take up time that really the team can handle yes. or someone else can handle in service to the bigger yes, which is the deep work, the deep concentrated work, the pro, you know, the things that you need to be productive on. But it's very hard to, for people to do that because they're just, we're so trained. We have such a bias toward action in our culture. But I would also say it's important to think of service to ourselves. Yes. And we, we neglect ourselves. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'd like for us to reframe thinking about how we use our devices instead of trying to pack as much as we can into our days. Let's reframe it and think about how we can use our devices and change our relationship with technology so that we can have better well-being, so that right. we can be more positive. And we can do that by, by not packing so much back-to-back -back into our, our days. And of course, technology affords this possibility for us to be able to you know, do more tasks but let's intentionally think about our limited mental resources and, and what we could do to, to nourish them, to keep right. ourselves, you know, keep our capacity full. And then right. we, we can really perform better. Right. You know, mental exhaustion or activity or lack of, you know, lack of doing the recovery that leads to mental exhaustion it doesn't just lead to kind of stress and poor health or, you know, sleep problems, but also you, you, you're really depriving yourself of learning. Right. Mm. And so now there's research out, I'm sure you're aware of that, you know, if you have a, a deep engagement or, you know, conversation where your mind is really, really engaged or, or writing 
at, at the end of that, if you don't take a break, then your mind doesn't have the time to like absorb and disseminate and organize all that knowledge and to do the things it needs to do to integrate so that you have the deep learning, you know, that you, you could have. And so then your brain, then your brain tries to do all that at night from all the different learning periods that happen during the day. And there's all these other factors going on because the exhaustion and the stress, so you don't sleep well. And so it just, it just never happens. That's right. you're, You're crippling your learning ability. That's right. Patterned learning is, is the best way to, to learn something. Right. Um, and, you know, I teach students who I see cram for exams at the last minute, and that's the worst way to try to learn something. Sure. But you, you do need to space out and have breaks between How much time? Learning. Like, let's say an hour, let's say someone took an hour to really, in, a, in absorption, listen to this podcast. Do they need just a couple minutes, five minutes? What's a good time to give your brain a little time to digest and you know, it, it depends on so many things. It, it depends on the material you're learning right. or thinking about. It depends on what your current capacity is. If you're, you know, full of mental resources, you'll be able to absorb a lot more. Right. Uh, so it, it depends on a number of things. But I, I would say even allowing days to intervene can help with right. with learning. Yeah. Okay, we're kind of running short on time, but I want to get into, like, if someone's listening to this and going, holy cow, yeah, I am utterly a victim of kinetic attention, and I need to do something about it. So what do they do? There's a lot of things that people can do. So we we talked about getting a good night's sleep. We talked about breaks. Uh, Another really important thing to consider is that attention is goal oriented. You pay attention to what your goal is and think about what is your most important goal for the day. Mm -hmm. And that's going to guide your attention. Now we did a study, this was done at Microsoft Research, was led by a colleague of mine, Alex Williams. Mm -hmm. And we gave people a conversational software agent that would ask people at the beginning of each day, what, what's your goal for the day? What, what do you hope to accomplish in terms of work? And what's your emotional goal? How do you want to feel by mm-hmm. the end of the day? And when people were reminded of their goals first thing in the morning, they actually stuck to their goals uh, better. But here's what we also learned. The effect didn't last very long, right? And it what we discovered is that people have to be continually reminded of goals. Once in the, once the morning is not good enough. Mm-hmm. We need continual reminders. Goals are the best thing that can keep us on track and shield us from distractions, even distractions that originate from within ourselves. Mm-hmm. So be having your goal front and center and you, you do whatever you need to do. If it means writing it down on a post-it note, uh, you know, keeping it on a piece of paper near you, uh, or if, if you have the capability to keep reminding yourself, that's, mm-hmm. that's really important. So another thing people can do is to learn how to practice what I call meta-awareness. So you talked about your experience with meditation. Mm-hmm. And um, during the pandemic, my university offered us a course in mindfulness-based stress reduction. And I was very fascinated with the idea of keeping your mind focused on the present. Mm -hmm. And I realized that when we are on our devices, we can practice the same kind of thing. Because when, when when we don't have controlled attention, Mm-hmm. And our mind wanders. That's that's when we're susceptible to distractions, right? That's when a, a notification can come in, or we might have an urge in ourselves to go to social media, right? That's that can happen very easily, but we can learn to probe ourselves to keep asking ourselves questions. When you feel that urge to go to social media, you can ask yourself. Do I really need to go to social media now? Why do I want to go? Mm -hmm. Is it because I'm bored? And you can, it's easy to stop yourself. It's easy to make these automatic 
actions, much more intentional and controlled, mm -hmm. right? If I have this urge to grab my smartphone, I can ask myself, wait a minute, why do I need to look at it? Right. Chances are I don't have a good reason. And that's enough to keep me on track. So I've learned to practice the skill of meta-awareness. And it is a skill. And it's a mm -hmm. skill that anyone right. can learn. And it and it does help keep people on track. Right. Um, there's there's another thing that people can do, which is practicing forethought. And what that means is understanding how your current actions are going to affect your future self. And that mm -hmm. future self is later in the day. Mm -hmm. If if I'm a person who can easily spend 30 minutes on social media, right? Before I go to social media, imagine, visualize what your end of the day is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Am I going to be up at 10 o'clock finishing that overdue report? Or am I going to be feeling fulfilled? I accomplished what I had set out to do. I'm going to be reading a book drinking a glass of wine, relaxing. So imagine and visualize what your current actions, what the impact your current actions will have on your life at the mm -hmm. end of the day or even in a few hours. Mm -hmm. I love that. Those are such great skills. I love the terminology, future thought. We do a, a visualization around future me and ideal self and also dirt dive, which is a name we, got, we used to use in the military, in the SEALs, right? So we used to... Mm -hmm. You know, every operation we would do this, but we called it because uh, dirt diving, because when we dove uh, on a combat dive profile, we would visualize the whole thing in great detail. Mm -hmm. And then we would also go out into, you know, the environment and walk it as if we were going to dive it. Right. And so we'd have multiple checkpoints in our virtual reality mind space right before we ever got in the water. But, yeah. And so I use that term in the morning, I, and it's similar to what you just described, although there is a distinction. I said, dirt dive your day, go through your day, you know, major event by major event. So by, they've already mm -hmm. checked their calendar. They've already determined what their most important goal or target is and when and how they're going to get that done, when they're going to get their training. And then, then you go through and you visualize the whole thing. But what you're talking about is visualizing it, like what would happen if you also did something that wasn't conducive to an ideal outcome. I love That's that. right. That's right. It's like almost That's similar right. in the seals. We would, we would uh, visualize all the things that could go wrong and how we were going to respond. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. And, and if you visualize here, here's what I want my end of the day to look like, you know, right. I want to be relaxing right. and you want a good night's sleep. I right. want a good night's sleep. And that's good enough motivation to keep you on track. That is awesome. For a more immediate intervention, you know, I've heard of people taking uh, iPhone kind of breaks or, you know, literally they sell now little beds at night. You can put your iPhone in and put it to sleep so it's not there in the morning to grab right when you wake up. Those are fun little interventions, I bet. Well, I, I'm, I'm actually a believer that people have to develop their own agency yes. to control their attention. And I know there's there's a lot of good apps out there and mm -hmm. devices like you talked about, um, and it's it's like training wheels right. on a bike, and you never learn how to ride the bike. So I, I'm much more of a believer that, and I, and I think people can develop their own agency right. to be in control. Yeah, that's true. Some, some may be thinking easier for you to say. <laughs> so the intervention might be fine as long as you don't make the intervention the main thing. Right? Yes. It's been a fascinating conversation, Dr. Mark. Thanks so much. So your book is, um, is out in the marketplace. It's called Attention Span. Um, what's next for you? Are you uh, working on oh, something, else, something I, new? I, I am. I'm, I'm working on a number of things. Um, I mean, one of the things I'm working on is um, teams and remote work and how, how teams are able to uh, manage remote work. Um, I'm also doing a lot more thinking about uh, how we can control our attention better and 
how we can improve our relationship with our devices. That's Mm -hmm. been a central concern of mine for many, many years. And Mm -hmm. I'll continue to think about that. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your work and thank you for your time today. It's a fascinating conversation. I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, you're welcome.